This okay, conference will teachers, now be recorded. The viruses and bacteria are very, very effective. So we don't worry about them being effective. We worry about the immune system being effective to counter the infections. The major components, as we said, the B cells, they make about 60% of all human immune deficiency. The most common ever humoral immune deficiency is selective IgA deficiency. Thankfully, it's not usually severe. Well, the majority of patients are either asymptomatic or get some mucosal infections. So sinus infections or pneumonia or UTIs rarely, but usually IgA deficiency is asymptomatic, but it is the most common selective antibody deficiency. Uh, we know that IgG is the only antibody has serotonin placenta, and that occurs mostly in the third trimester. And, and, and it tends to uh, increase gradually by production through the child themselves. That's why if you get a premature delivery, you're already immunocompromised. There's a huge difference between immunocompromised and immune deficient. And the difference is this. All children are immunocompromised because they have an immature immune system that will not be mature until they're about 10 to 16 years of age. All children are immunocompromised. And then you get immunocompromised status because of temporary reasons. For example, prematurity, or because of having reflux or allergy, or because of having other disease that you lose protein with. So immunocompromised status is in all children a usually a temporary condition that will improve and resolve with time because of secondary causes. Primary immune deficiency is a permanent condition, or almost permanent. In some cases it's not, but usually it's permanent. In that case, you have a genetic disorder. It's an inherited disorder that will last usually for life. So you have to differentiate immunocompromised status, which is all children, and immune deficient status, which is specific group of children, who usually have family history of immune deficiency, cryptogenous marriages, unusual pattern of infection that we'll talk about, and unusual responses to vaccines and other problems. Those patients are, we're gonna focus on more in this talk. T cell defects affect about 30% of primary immune deficiency, usually combined with humoral because you need T cells to stimulate maturation of B cells. So it's almost, it's very difficult to get an isolated T cell defect. You always get T cell plus B cell, although not always in the form of skin. It can be combined, but not always skin. So combined immune deficiency, but not severe combined immune deficiency. In the severe combined cases, you lose the B cells and the T cells, and maybe the NK cells or one of them but especially the T cells should be absent or not functional. In combined immune deficiency, the T cell could be there as well, and not the same as skin, or could be deficient but not as severely, and the B cells on the components are available. But overall, the new system is affected. Phagocytic functions, they make about 5%. For example, uh, defects of migration and killing. Examples are like leukocyte adhesion defects, lab, or CGD, chronic gyrometrous disease are examples of that. And then you have complement defect. And complement defect could be early or late complement defects. Okay. Um, okay. The early complement defects is the C1 and C2 and C3. C1 reduces results in angioedema. It's not part of immune deficiency. C2 and C3 are part of severe septicemia and immune deficiency. Late uh, complement is what we call from C5 to C9, and those mainly present with Nigeria infection and recurrent meningitis, okay? And that's an important point to take home because it's a very common exam question. Late complement defects, C5 to C9, result in recurrent meningitis, usually with encapsulated organisms, more specifically with Nigeria infections. Okay, so the maturation of the immune system and production of new cells 
in is done in different places. B cells, T cells, and phagocytes produced in the bone marrow complement produced from the liver. That's why liver disease affected complement levels. Maturation of the B cells occurs in the bone marrow uh, and lymph nodes. The T cells maturation occurs in the thymus. And the phagocytes mature in the tissues. So uh, they could be in the skin, in the gut, in the brain, in the lymph nodes. And the function of the B cells is production of immunoglobulins, specific immunoglobulins of different types. But T cells produce cytokines. Now remember that T cells is your orchestra leader. Okay? T cells organize the whole orchestra of the immune system. Without T cells, you have no immune system. Okay? You can work with other deficiencies, but without T cell defeat, without T cells, we can't work. That's why when you have a T cell defect, you have to replace the bone marrow. There's no other choice. In other defects, we can discuss changing the bone marrow with a bone marrow transplant, but it's not always necessary. And in fact, sometimes it's harmful to it because the, the T cells are there in the bone marrow. Uh, and you have to first, sorry, kill the T cells before you do the bone marrow. If your T cells are normal and functional, they act as sources of rejection in the future. So remember this, T cells is your orchestra leader. Without T cells, you need a bone marrow transplant. Other defects you may only Immune system maturation uh, is gradual. You can see through this graph already. I don't know if you see the cursor. Can you see the cursor? Uh, I run. You don't see the cursor, I think. Yeah. So let me just. Uh, okay. So so you see there uh, uh, the, the 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 red the red line. Yeah? And so we're going back again. It's a bit slow with the net connection. So you can see that the, the red line. This is your infant. This is your maternal immunoglobulin after birth. So this is from birth to about 10 years of age. Birth, its maternal level is high, as high as the mother's level of immunoglobulin. And then it goes down by the time you're six months with a neighbor. And then it completely goes away around 12 months of age. Your own production of immunoglobulin in the child increases gradually, which is the green line, and you reach adult level by the time you're 10 years of age. So we have a reference value all that, and that depends on uh, the graph that I'll show you now. So this graph, I don't know if it's coming to you or not, it's, it's a bit slow with internet maybe. Can you see this graph? Okay, it's coming now. So when you look at the IgG level in infants, you look for the reference range. The reference range is dependent on the age of the child. Okay, so you look at this table. And you see that you go to normal level immunoglobulin, which is the new age or adult level at birth, at around 12 years, around 9 to 12, 12 years of age. Sorry, is that, is that clear? Yes, you see at birth, 1 to 3 months, the immunoglobulin is around 8.5 to 13.5, which is the level in the mother. And you get to the same level around 9 to 11 years of age again. So you're only back to adult level when you're 9 to 11 years of age. IgA level, in fact, takes longer, sometimes up to 16 years of age, to get normal IgA levels. And at birth, it's almost, almost not there. Is the connection okay? I, I'm just feeling that the connection is not going very... Good. Are you hearing me well? I just need a yes from someone. Yes? Okay. Yes, the question is fine, Victor. Thank you. Keep going. Thank okay, you, Victor. Okay. okay, so the functional immunoglobulins, you all know very well. Uh, it depends really on the sub-level as well. So we have the IgG uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The IgG 1 and 4, and 3, sorry, have similar functions. IgG2 and 4 have similar functions. The IgG1 and 3 work against proteins mostly, glycoprotein antigens, and like diphtheria and tetanus. They are T cell dependent. 
because proteins are not strong and because sorry proteins are strong immunostimulants they are strong immunostimulants the IgG1 response is quite strong at birth okay and we conjugate those vaccines okay when we think about glycoprotein glycoprotein antigens okay so haemophilus influenza and for example pneumococcal uh, are glycoproteins okay and those glycoproteins they don't produce they don't produce uh, good immune responses at birth that's why the vaccine is conjugated with other proteins okay in, in order to kind of um, let's say trick the immune system to produce a stronger immune response and produce immunity okay And the polysaccharide antigen responses usually are IgG2, okay? Uh, and those you get adequate responses at around two years of age, okay? You can test for that at birth by testing for isohemoglutinins, which are naturally occurring IgM antibodies in the ABO blood groups, okay? And uh, this can be done through the blood bank. So if you don't have a test for uh, polysaccharide antigen responses. If you want, don't know if the patient is immune deficient for polysaccharide antigen uh, responses, you can do isohemoglutinins through the blood bank. And that's important for meningococcal and pneumococcal uh, uh, antigens. And these are as well are T cell uh, independent. The IgG function, okay, works against viruses in mycoplasma for IgG1 and IgG3 and against allergens for IgG4. Now, if you get a high dose exposure of an allergen, for example, if you're allergic to a cat, your IgE level, which is the allergen component, will be very high. Once you get tolerance to the, to the, to the cat, for example, because of immunotherapy treatment, which is desensitization for the cat allergen, your IgG4 gets higher. This is not part of immune deficiency. This is only part of tolerance for immunoglobulins, okay? All the specific antibody responses at birth are usually not strong, okay? Especially polysaccharide antibody responses. And these take a long time to reach adult level. In the neonates, the immune system is not strong because we have a lot of the circulating B, uh, B cells are immature CD5 cells. Unlike adults, they're about only 25% immature cells. The majority are immature. And these make the chance of autoantibodies higher, okay? So the reason you have immature B cells in the neonate is that the immune system is learning. And if you had mature B cells, you'd have autoimmunity in high degrees in the neonate which is, as you know, is very, very rare. So this is God work, Hikmat Rabbil Alameen, that the B cells at birth and the T cells at birth, even the mother immune system at birth is not strong against the child, because if it was, there would be miscarriages. If the child has a strong immune system in neutral and at birth, a mature immune system, they would have a lot of autoimmune disorders and have rejections and will not be able to survive in neutral as well. So it's immature at the beginning, and that in order to keep them alive. At the same time, it gives them a higher risk of infection. As you get older, you increase your mature cells and reduce your immature cells, and that increases your chance of autoimmune disease as you get to teenage times, and at the same time gives you stronger immunity. You got the idea. The T cell development as well is it in the thymus at birth, but as you get older, the, uh, the maturity occurs in other places, in the spleen and reticular endothelial system, you get more maturity of T cells, and the bone marrow as well. But at birth, the thymus is the area of maturity of uh, the T cells. The size of the thymus is huge at birth. Can take on the x-ray like you can see maybe the size of the heart or bigger 
as you get older, replaced by adipose tissue and get smaller in size. Okay. Now you have to remember that the thymus is very, very sensitive to stress. So if you get a child with septicemia into the hospital or the ICU within 24 to 48 hours, the thymus will be absent from the X-ray. It's important to note this because we look for absent thymus as a sign of T-cell defect and skip. But you have to be careful if the child is sick, the stress of cortisol and stress of infection would result in shrinking of the thymus very, very rapidly. So it should not be taken at that time as a sign of immunodeficiency by itself. It should look for other signs as well. The T-cell numbers as well at birth in children are higher but they are less mature, okay? So you have a higher proportion of CD4 cells because you need a lot of cytokines at, at the beginning, and you have a less number of CD8 cells, which are your cytotoxic uh, B cells or cytotoxic uh, uh, cells. Uh, as you get older, they get, they get uh, uh, the ratio is inverted. You get more of the CD8 cell stimulation and less than the CD4 cells. But Again, the ratio remains higher for CD4 than it is for CD8. If you have low CD3, CD34 cells, uh, raw cells, then it means you have no memory. Okay? If you have no memory, memory your immune system is slower, <coughs> sorry, and less effective. Okay? And in newborns, obviously, you have no memory cells, and that's normal for uh, a newborn. But it means your immune system is poor as well. You have lower CD40 expression, you have less ability to do class switching in, in the neonates. And you have less NK cells, which means you're less likely to counter the effect of viruses. That's why you have a higher chance of viral illness, RSV, and other viruses uh, in the younger than one year of age. And you have normal proliferation rates. So the, the cells can proliferate very rapidly, like you have in the adults, but they're less effective. The cytokines as well are less in the children. So you have less TNF alpha under stress. And then because of this, you have less febrile responses. And that's why when you get a neonate who's 12 months and less and having sign of a, a fever, it means it's a very high risk situation because the response normally for fever is usually absent or very low at this age. So if you do have a response, that means you have a very, very severe infection, okay? And many children have even meningitis at two months of age and don't have a fever because they don't have enough TNF alpha production. As well, IL-5, IL-10 uh, IL is, is, is high, okay? And IL-10 is important to uh, suppress the immune system at birth and prevent rejection. So it's by nature, it's God's work that the IL-10 is is high and that suppresses your macrophage function and makes you less immune at birth. Your IL-5 as well is less in the neonate, your interferon gamma is less in the neonate, uh, lymphotoxins for neutrophil migration and maturation is less in the neonate, as well as IL-3, IL-4 uh, for T-cell maturation. So the whole immune system is less mature to preserve the child and prevent the child from auto having autoimmune disease, and at the same time, it makes them immature and less able to counter infections. So in conclusion, this is about the immune system, just the basic setting. Um, a child is a neurocompromised host. I'm not talking about immune deficiency now. Please focus on neurocompromised host with immature immune system. And that's very important to understand. You get milestones gradually achieved as you get older, and you have those milestones with vaccinations. And despite that, a, a child generally does well because the immune system is not a single cell. It's a collaboration of the whole immune system, and it develops immun immunity slowly when you give them vaccination. And you get as well what we call a herd immunity, right? Okay, they call it maybe but I'd like to call it because the whole population is vaccinated and immune, 
we get more immunity. Again, a breastfeeding child would have a better immunity because they get exposed to the mother bacteria through the breastfeeding, through prebiotics and probiotics in the breastfeeding, through bacteria in the mother's breast itself, and through the viruses and illnesses the mother gets. She develops all antibodies and she breastfeeds at the same time. And that's a huge component why the immune system in breastfed babies is more mature than it is in non-breastfed babies and at a much faster rate. <clears throat> so now, we're going to talk about immune deficiency. Again, I want to check, is the voice coming well and the images coming well? Can you just confirm with me, Dr. Ali Jane? Yeah, the voice is very well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So immune deficiency is classified as primary or uh, secondary immune deficiency. Uh, primary is what I told you about as being inherited, uh, usually inherited in consanguineous families. It's a lifelong disease, okay? Secondary immune deficiency is acquired either because uh, a viral illness like HIV or because of other cases, could be because of drugs, infections, uh, and other things. Okay, in your history, you'll find out whether this is a primary or secondary immune deficiency. And that will make a difference between a good physician and not so good physician. And that will make a difference between you asking a consultation for an immunologist or not asking a consultation for an immunologist. First, rule out secondary causes, then think about primary causes, unless you have red flags and red signs, which we're going to talk about later. I'm sure you got exposed to that in many lectures before as well. Okay? So there are many factors that contribute to the risk of recurrent infection. And they're actually much more common than primary immune deficiency. Primary immune deficiency is about, let's say about 6% of the population. These other causes of recurrent infections are much higher, are much higher causes of primary immune deficiency. Allergic disease is a cause of recurrent infection. It's a present interfering responses to viruses. And even your mucosa, your nasal mucosa, your lung mucosa is inflamed. And that suppresses your immune system in those tissues and allows you to get recurrent infections. So that's why asthma patients have recurrent infections. Rhinitis and sinus patients have recurrent infections. And that's because the allergy is not being treated well, not because they have immune deficiency. Neurological problems, problem with aspirations, swallowing, and respiratory effort, abnormal skin because of eczema, because of other inherited skin disorders, you break the skin because of burns, you get recurrent infections. Environmental components, you get recurrent exposures, day caves, cool A siblings, even smoking. Smoking is a very important cause, a very important cause of recurrent infections in, for example, otitis media. It's a very known and strong factor for recurrent otitis media in young children if you have smoke exposure at home but it's well for asthma and other components. Reflux disease, anatomical abnormalities, uh, whether it's urinary abnormalities or uh, vascular rings or skeletal abnormalities affecting the breathing system or swallowing process. Foreign bad, uh, bodies, uh, a foreign valve or a foreign stent or prosthesis or catheter, like when you have a patient who's in the ICU, an ICU child with a catheter getting UTI, not immune deficient, even if they get it 10 times. I don't care. If you have a catheter, remove the catheter, then talk about immune deficiency. A congestive heart failure, so wet lungs, uh, cystic fibrosis, it's actually much more common than you have primary immune deficiency in many populations. Uh, in some populations, it's one in 250, like in Ireland. Okay? Uh, so think about other problems. Immotasia syndrome as well, okay? Malnutrition is a cause of secondary immune deficiency. So vitamin A deficiency results in GI infections and respiratory tract infections. Zinc deficiency, okay, like kid-like syndrome, B12 deficiency, in, 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 uh, affects the maturity of your B cells, so it affects your immunoglobulin production. Protein calorie deficiency, like malnutrition, impaired immune responses there as well because of malnutrition and effect on T cell and B cell maturation, malignancy, uh, chemotherapy, metabolic disorders, uh, diabetes, galactosemia, amino acid disorders, all affect your T cell and B cell function by effect on the maturity. It's a toxic effect. It's a toxic effect 
not a primary immune deficiency. Protein losing neutropathy and disease, and then you have HIV and acquired immune deficiency. Okay. So I'm going to come to the details of the history now. Okay. The clinical element of the history are very important. You should ask when was the first infection encountered and what kind of infection it was. In skid patients, usually the presentation is early <clears throat> because you have a very severe combined immune deficiency and that presents usually before three months of age, but up to four to five months of age. So a child who has lymphopenia, so low lymphocyte count, and that's been diagnosed above one year of age without too many recurrent infections, this probably does not have skid, but may have other immune deficiency disorders. So skid, usually below three months of age. Phagocytic disorders like lab, usually before, uh, before that age. And usually, leukocyte adhesion defect is diagnosed because of the delayed cord separation. But as you get older, you can get uh, IgE, um, hyper IgE syndrome, and that's again a phagocytic defect. In those patients, they have inability to lose their primary teeth. Because to lose your primary teeth, you need phagocytic function. And if you have abnormal phagocytic function, you don't have cord separation, and you don't lose your primary teeth. So if you ask a child who's like 10 with recurrent infections, did you, do you still have your primary teeth? They say yes. That's a suspicion of hyper IgE syndrome, especially if you have eczema and asthma at the same time, because you start to lose your primary teeth at around six years of age. Okay? Uh, if you have a pure B cell defect, usually you present above six months of age, because until that time, the maternal IG gene is giving you some protection. History of recurrent infections is important. We'll talk about the type and, and kind of infection. Site of infection. Now, remember two things about site of infection. Pharyngitis, UTI, almost never, almost never a primary immune deficiency. They are not sites where you get primary immune deficiency infections. Very, 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 very rarely, and that's 0.01% or thereabouts. You get an IgA deficiency that's so severe that gives you recurrent pharyngitis or UTI. Overall, recurrent pharyngitis and UTIs, no matter how frequent they are, they are part, they're not part, not part of primary immune deficiency. Type of infection, opportunistic infections, unusual infections, we'll come to talk about that. GI symptoms, many uh, immune deficiency cases get GI complaints or skin complaints. They're the two most common sites of complaints. Autoimmune disease, we get that in B cell defects. And that's a, one of the important hallmarks of B cell defects. So, idiopathic homocytopenia, and autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid disease, and lupus, specifically lupus, okay? Even interstitial uh, lung disease or even uh, um, nephrotic or nephritic syndromes. Could be part of immune deficiency because of ultra antibodies and they're usually B cell defects. In those patients, sometimes you lose the proteins, like we have a nephritic syndrome, and that gives you an added component of B cell defect or immunoglobulin defect. Family history is critical for primary immune deficiency. The majority of primary immune deficiency are either uh, they are consagenous, either autosomal recessive or X linked. So always ask in your history about the consanguinity of the parents. Adverse reactions to vaccines, usually with live vaccines, for example, you get the BCG, you develop BCG-itis, so large lymph nodes and prolonged fever, okay? And the same with other vaccines. You get, you get the polio vaccine, if it's a live vaccine, you get poliomyelitis. You get the, the enterovirus vaccine, the rotor vaccine, and you get severe sepsisemia and enteritis and diarrhea. So, with live vaccines, you get the disease of the vaccine. Measles, mumps, rubella. You get those diseases if you get the vaccine. Again, a failure of the vaccine response. So if you get, for example, a pneumococcal vaccine, full pneumococcal vaccine, and then you develop a pneumococcal septicemia, 
when you're about two years of age. You have to think why this patient has not developed immunity to pneumococcal infection. That can be because it's a different serotype that's not covered by the vaccine or because they have immune deficiency that's B cell dependent. So red flags, you, you probably heard about them. I gave them in many lectures. Many doctors probably gave them many lectures. Because we talk about them very frequently. We need to have two red flags to think as a pediatrician in the community, not in the hospital, in the community, in the family practice about primary immune deficiency. Okay? So remember the rule of twos. Twos means two infections. Because the first infection you're allowed to have. You have no memory, you have a poor immune, immune system. The second infection makes you suspicious because you should have had immunity with memory cells with a second infection. And that's why we talk about two infections or more at being a risk. But two infections of the same type, focus on the same type. So having one pneumonia, one septicemia of different bugs doesn't always mean you have immune deficiency. It's not a high risk unless you are the quite severe ICU admissions. But otherwise, it could happen in normal immune system. Four or more ear infections, the red flag. Two or more serious sinus infection within one year. Okay, all within one year. And that sinus infection, you know, difficult to diagnose under three years of age because the sinus is not really mature. So this is usually above four years of age when we think about sinus infections. And two or more months of antibiotics with little effect. This is in the community, not in the hospital. In the hospital, two weeks is enough to be suspicious. Okay, two weeks is enough especially when the infection requires that kind of antibiotic. For example, in osteomyelitis, it's normal to require two weeks of IV antibiotics, four weeks of antibiotics. So that's normal. So we talk about an requirement that's beyond expected for this kind of infection. Two or more pneumonia within one year. I'm talking about good going pneumonias, okay? This is not the joke. A lower pneumonia, pneumonia with effusions, a severe pneumonia. I'm not talking about reticular diphtheria shadows, okay? I'm talking about the serious pneumonia there, to be suspicious. The chicken DTA shadows are common viral pneumonias. They're not by themselves alone a reason to be suspicious, even if they got repeated. Failure to gain weight or failure to thrive is important. Recurrent deep seated infection, so this is abscesses of the psoas muscle, abscesses of the internal organs like the liver or the lungs. Okay? Uh, persistent oral flush in the mouth or elsewhere on the skin. It's important to note that this is, this should be above one year of age, okay? Because oral thrush is very common under one year of age because of the breastfeeding or bottom feeding, and it's very common with the immune system as well. If it's not responding to medication under one year of age, all of it's systemic, so affecting the skin, the blood, the nails, or associating with other features, then this is a risk factor or a worry. But otherwise, Normal oral thrush or diaper thrush, diaper candida, is very normal under one year. Need for intravenous antibiotic infections. I'm not talking about big deal about the hospital patients. In the community, if you cannot clear the infection unless you need IV antibiotics, this is which should raise your suspicion. Two or more deep seated infection. So the first one, sorry, was deep skin or organ abscess, but it should mean in this one severe infection. So septicemia. So meningitis, okay? Uh, family history of primary immune deficiency is important as well. Okay. So now just talking a little bit about predominant P-cell defects and T-cell defects, okay? And um, my voice is still clear and the slides going well. Yes, the voice is clear, Victor. Come on. Okay, so predominant B-cell defects. Okay, we usually start after six months of age. We can get a lot of autoimmune disorders with B cell defects. And uh, the bacteria effect on that case is usually strep, staph, hemophilus influenza, and combinobacter, giardia, and cryptosporidia. So they give you chronic infections, okay, chronic diarrhea sometimes, salmonella, cryptosporidia, and so on. But remember that B cells can give you viral infections of the enterovirus group, okay? So that's, for example, rotavirus and poliovirus can happen in these cell defects. Recurrent cytopulmonary infections, GI infections, malabsorption, 
arthritis, viral meningitis, and meningocephalitis could be part of the B cell defects as well, especially if they're enterovirus meningitis. Okay. Autoimmunity, so you get sometimes large lymph nodes, and an important component as well with B cell defects, they can present with malignancies because you have a high risk of malignancy as well, more than 10% chance. They get thymomas as well, and they get lymphomas. Cytal infection, when we talk about ear infections, mastoiditis, B cells, sinusitis as well, B, B cells, we get bronchiectasis and pneumonia, usually B cell. Meningitis could be B cell or could be complement, like in terminal complement. Septicemia could be B cell or terminal complement or even part of T cell uh, defects uh, or neutrophil defects as well. We get septicemia, skin infections, gingival stomatitis, organ abscesses, uh, and uh, sorry, and lymph adenitis. This could be part of uh, neutrophil phagocytic defects and IgE syndromes. With T cell defects, all of this can happen because T cell defects wipes out your immune system in the majority of cases. So anything can happen with the T cell defect. But in a specific recurrent infection with this site, you have to think about these defects more specifically. The slides I'm sure are going to be saved and given to you later on, so I'll just continue to talk about this, okay? Predominant T-cell defects, usually the onset is below six months of age. They are usually very severe and progressive. They don't respond to medication very well. They can get any kind of infection, but mycobacterial infections and viruses are more severe and more predominant in clear T-cell defects, especially CMV, EBV, varicella. You can get phagocytic infections, parasitic infections as well, PCP, pneumococcal, and pneumonia, mycobacterium avium as well. Okay, so T cells are very specific for those, but can occur with any infection. They're more severe with failure to thrive, protracted diarrhea, and extensive mucosal candidiasis. And you can get graft versus host disease caused by maternal engraftment. Okay, so for example, a child could be born and they carry their mother's, their mother's cells, stem cells and other antibodies and cells and blood cells. And some of those cells actually come through breastfeeding as well. And in T cell defects, the body responds to those engrafted maternal cells as, they, as if they are a foreign body, or sorry, the vice versa. So the maternal cells attack the infant tissue, okay? Because the tissue, the tissue, uh, the, the child does not have an immune system, and they think you get it's like a, the, the child is a, a foreign body for those cells, okay? So you can get graphless host disease by the maternal engraftment of the maternal cells into the infant. That's why if you, you have suspicion of skin from the newborn, the child should you should be careful with the child and. Not give, not give any blood products early on and try to do the bone marrow transplant as soon as possible. Hypercalcemic titany infants, that can occur as well when you have a, a problem with your thymus. And that's very common when you have a T cell defect because the thymus is absent in T cell defects as a site of the maturation of T cells. Granulocyte defect, granulocyte defect. This is early onset usually, affect the skin and the bone. So you get the delayed cord separation. Usually the cord can be separated, you know, in the first week or two weeks of life, rarely up to three weeks of life. If it goes up to more than four weeks, you have to be suspicious why it's not being separated, okay? So it's okay to wait for the first two weeks, for sure, okay? You get poor wound healing. You get bacterial infections, Pseudomonas, Cerachia, Klebsiella. These are common in granulocyte defects like CGD and leukosubstitution defect, leucardia. If you get an abscess with chronic granulitis disease, it's very common to see Pseudomonas, Cerachia, Klebsiella, and fungi and candida, and candida and aspergillus in those abscesses. Okay? You get dermatitis and skin problems in granulocytic defects, so encotidios, cellulitis, superlative lymphadenitis. Periodontitis and osteomyelitis. Complement defect, we talked about earlier and late. The late, you get the Nigerian infection, the meningitis, septic arthritis, and gonorrhea. 
In the early, it's usually autoimmune disease. Uh, although with C3, you can get fulminant septicemia and death as well. Okay. The adverse reaction to vaccines as well. Live polio vaccine, you get a reaction with TMD some. Now in Kuwait, uh, we use the live vaccine for the first dose. And the program, I think, is changing. We've changed it to non-live vaccination like it is in the States <clears throat> for the second and third dose. And there's been negotiation about giving the first dose as being as well uh, non-live. I may be mistaken about this, so you need to read about it. I'm not sure about the latest changes now. But we use the oral live vaccination because it has better immune responses. Uh, in the States, we are using now only non-live vaccine, and that gives you protection against the uh, live polio if you have immune deficiency. Uh, in Kuwait, we are still using the live vaccine, I believe, maybe in the second or third dose, I'm not really sure, but we use the first dose as in non-live. Please check it, okay, and don't quote me on that one. Please check it and let me know, okay? If anybody knows this information, they can volunteer now, because I'm not really sure. But if you have a live vaccination early in life and you have T cell defect you skip, you will get uh, poliomyelitis. BCG vaccination as well results in disease and in interferon with gamma defects and phagocytic defects as well as T cell defects. Blood plasma, if you give a blood product to a patient who has IgA deficiency, they will develop anaphylaxis. Examination and a benign examination does not rule out immune deficiency. Okay, you can have cases where you have no lymph nodes, like T cell defect, or have large lymph nodes in some B cell defects, or some B cell defect without lymph nodes. But there are patterns you have to think about. Look for generalized appearance, hair, and connective tissue problems, dysmorphic features that can occur, like the George syndrome. Gingivitis, dental erosion is a sign of sinusitis that can occur in B cell defects and phagocytic defects. Tonsillar tissue, uh, because you can have absent tonsils in skin or in B cell defects, although you can have disease of B cell defect where you have large tonsils, the absence of tonsils indicates a B cell defect. Okay? Splenomegaly as well. Absent spleen could be, mean uh, absent B cells or could mean that you have a normal immune system. Sometimes a large screen is immune deficiency, so it's hard to tell. Okay. Arthritis, ataxia, and neurological defects. I'm specifically talking about ataxia telangiectasia, where you have a B cell or T cell combined defect. Uh, in those cases, one they present with telangiectasia, they present ataxia as well. Okay, so eczema petechiae, you have to think about with B cell defects as well, risk, risk of Alup syndrome, you get recurrent infections. Telangiectasia, think about ataxia telangiectasia. Ocular cutaneous albinism, think about chiliac higashi, especially if you have the normally looking hair. The dermatomyositis like rash, X linked agamoglobinemia, you give dermatitis, and dermatomyositis. Chronic dermatitis with hyper IgE syndrome, especially if you have asthma and if you don't use your, your teeth, your primary teeth. Generalized molluscular occurs in B cell defects, but more common in T cell defects. Now I'm not talking about the, the you know the, the usual pattern. I'm talking about severe, severe molluscan contagiosum. Okay? So in those cases, especially if you have other features, think about these defects. Uh, especially with cavity acid and viral infections, atypical infections, you think about T cell defects. The last few slides about laboratory evaluation. Okay, I know it's a long talk, but it's, I'm trying to be thorough with you. Uh, so uh, you need to think about the immune system as being numbers and function. So if you think about an army protecting the borders in Kuwait, okay, the army could be a thousand soldiers. This is the number of your soldiers protecting your country borders. But the function of those uh, uh, soldiers is even as important, if not more important, so when you talk about immune deficiency, primary immune deficiency, you have to say, I have abnormal function of the immune system, not only abnormal numbers. You can have a thousand soldiers 
but they are not working. And that's primary inefficiency. Or you can have 500 soldiers and they're working as effective as a thousand soldiers. And that's not primary inefficiency. So keep in mind, having normal immunoglobulin levels does not mean you don't have immune deficiency. It's one of the markers of immune deficiency, but does not rule it out. So do a CBC as a primary investigation. We look for white cell count, uh, absolute neutrophil count, okay? Look for appropriate age values. Look for lymphopenia. Remember this very important thing, okay? A lymphopenia at birth is suspicious of primary immune deficiency skid until proven otherwise. Because lymphocyte count at birth should be high normally. And if the child has low lymphocyte count, this should ring the bells and be suspicious. If you have persistently high absolute beautiful count, that's suspicious of lymphocyte adhesion defect. They should go down later on. Hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia occurs in some B cell defects. Okay? So the, second, the first step includes the CBC and doing the global level. Make sure your total albumin level is normal, so it doesn't affect your IgG level, because that can affect your IgG level. Uh, the IgG subclasses are usually not required as a screening, so I don't recommend you do it at all in the population of pediatrics. It can be done in adults sometimes, but do not do them in pediatrics, usually they are useless. The IgE only if severe chronic HOP or dermatitis, and leave that for the specialist. Then we do the qualitative evaluation of antibodies, okay? And that means the functional memory. Isohemoglutinins, they should be present if you have normal memory. If you have normal memory, you should develop antibodies to the vaccine components, your tetanus, diphtheria, and polysaccharide antibodies, okay? Normally what I do is, if you had your cycle of vaccination and it's low, I give a repeat vaccine and measure the levels again to make sure it's not a vaccine failure as a cause of this low antibody types. Okay? And you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, give vaccine that's not conjugated for um, the polysaccharide antibody responses under two years. So you have to be conjugated vaccine before you can test for the memory. The T cell function, we do skin test and we do the mitogen testing. This is a very specialized test you don't do. I do it as a specialist. So you can do a epidermal injection of antigen like candida or tetanus. We don't do that anymore. If you get a, a, a redness and duration more than five millimeters after 48 to 72 hours, it means you have uh, impaired T cell uh, responses. But that can be affected by steroids and severe illness as well. Or we do what we call lymphocyte stimulation testing, which is the mitogen testing. And that's by taking a sample from the mother or from the child, sorry, and a control sample, and sending the sample to the lab for stimulation by antigens in the lab, and you see how the T cells and B cells respond to stimulation. They should proliferate. If they don't proliferate, it means you have a problem with the function of T cells. Phagocytic function, we do the initial testing. You can do adhesion testing, CD11 and CD18, or do uh, NBT testing, which is the function of the neutrophils. Uh, or you can do specialized testing and, and flow cytometry for that, okay? So called DHR, dihydro uh, rhodium testing, that's done for a phagocytic function. Complement function, complements are difficult because they break down very easily and fast after you take the samples. So you should always take the sample for complement on ice, okay? Uh, you can do that. Total hemolytic complement, CH50 to 100. You can do C1S3 inhibitor levels, the AH50 levels for the alternative pathway. And, and you have to be careful about, as I said, you know, the handling of the sample. To the sample on ice, okay? This is a severe monoscope, right? And severe candida, typical of when you have a T cell defect. Uh, this is it's not very clear, you have telangiectasia, so you have dermatitis, uh, uh, microcytic thrombocytopenia, and purpura, so these are purpura and telangiectasia, uh, recurrent infection with encapsulated to organisms, uh, variable antibody levels, often low IgM, high IgA, and IgE with a poor antibody function with IgG, and that's usually 
get the gene, the wasp gene, in boys usually, so it's X-linked disease, and that's in most of other syndrome. So this is again the, the highlight of those red flags to consider. Okay, and this is my last slide. Uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I couldn't make it interactive. It's a lot of chatting and talking by myself. And uh, I just hope you can go back to those slides and it's clear enough for you. I don't know if you need to continue on questioning at this time, or we could leave the session and close now. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I'm sure if there's any questions here. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, Victor Fatma. If the ABO and compatibility is IgM. Okay. So this is a note I noted from the chat, you know, so uh, Dr. Dr. Hamid Haider uh, talking about the vaccine, that uh, the first three vaccinations are inactivated, yes, and the boosters are oral. And the reason we did that is because of the risk of the reaction of the oral live vaccination. So thank you for the information. Victor Afat, answer the question. If the ABO incompatibility is IgM, why do neonates get ABO incompatibility if maternal antibodies pass IgG? I can't come to all Victor, I didn't hear you. So I'll move the chat, Victor. Victor Fatma al Musawi Hakuta. If the ABO incompatibility is IgM. Why you need to get? I don't mean you get ABO incompatibility. What I meant is that we know the ABO blood groups. They are polysaccharide antigens on the RBCs. And if you develop isohemagglutinins, isohemagglutinins are IgM antibodies against those antigens. Okay? They don't cause a reaction. It just means that you have the ability to produce IgM, and that's the measure of the function of the immune system. In other words, if you don't have normal immune system, you don't produce those antibodies. You don't produce those isohemagglutinins. So it's a kind of a, a kind of primitive way to test the immune system, ability to produce antibodies. If you have the isohemagglutinins against blood groups, which is natural occurring, it's normal to have them. And that means your immune system is able to produce antibodies. Okay, thank you, Victor. Another question. Hey, Victor Abir, uh, when we talked about complement defect early for C2 and 3 and late for C5 and 9, how early and how late in age to expect? Yes, so this is, and again, it's a misunderstanding. It's called the late complement because the number is C5 to C9. It's not because they occur late in life. Okay, so this is called early complement because from C1 to C4, they are the number from 1 to 4. And they're called late complement because they are numbered from 5 to 9. Okay, so the late complement defect occurs even at birth. You can have meningitis with meningitis meningitis at early life, okay? It's not because of the age, it's because of the numbering. Okay. Any other question? Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Victor. It was very informative, very nice lecture, and very clear as well. All the best. Thank you. We can ask you.